out of the sheer interest of different kinds of music was to to learn about classical music, jazz music, R&B, African music, Brazilian music, um, musics from all over the world, and um, to try to incorporate various aspects of each kind of music into into what I do as as a player, as an improviser, as a soloist, as a composer, arranger, and all the rest. Um, and I, I I think I think there's a lot of room for further collaboration. I mean, I've been trying to write music for uh, tenor saxophone and symphony orchestra for several years and have a couple of pieces that, that, that uh, have been played that, again, kind of cross genre. Um, and uh, it's, it's a beautiful life. You know, it's really, it's, it's a wonderful thing and I, I don't take it lightly to have the opportunity to travel the world and, and play the music I hear in my head and feel in my heart. It's, it's just it's an incredible thing. So I think, you know, I, I, I value it. I work very hard at it and uh, appreciate anyone who listens. So, you know, it's a nice thing. Um, you know, to just be a saxophonist in this day and age is somewhat of a precarious endeavor. Uh, because as you can see at this convention, there are many, many saxophonists. So, I've always felt to augment playing the instrument, it was very important to, as I just mentioned, really be aware of different kinds of styles. By all means, have a specialty, but but know know the history of the instrument, know you know what kind of music have been played on the saxophone. It will only enhance whatever it is that you do, and along with that, to 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 be a controller of your environment through composition and arranging. You know, at the very least, to to be able to arrange some Bach for a saxophone ensemble, you know, to be able to use arranging as a way of implementing your playing into a specific situation. And the guys in Sax Assault all are, are very well versed at doing precisely that. They, they all are players and composers and arrangers. So I, I think it's all part of being a complete musician in, in this day and age. Um, you know, the, the, if you come tonight and hear the Yellow Jackets, you will hear a representation of what I'm talking about, uh, because this quartet is very universal in terms of scope and style. I mean, frequently people ask, so, okay, you're in the Yellow Jackets, what kind of music is that? And I really have no answer other than to say it's the Yellow Jackets, because it's uh, very all-encompassing. It's not, it's not a jazz group, per se. Although there are, there's traditional jazz influence and contemporary jazz influence, but there's African jazz influence, there's Afro-Caribbean influence, there's all sorts of orchestral influences, a la Debussy, Aaron Copeland, Stravinsky, I mean, you know, it's pretty wide open, which is really a great thing as an artist, particularly as an improvising artist, to, to have that kind of palette to be able to explore all these different, different areas. So, um, You know, the, the, to wake up every morning and, and say, well, today I have an opportunity to better myself as a, as a player, as a musician, uh, is, is an incredible thing. And I, I, it, you know, I mean, this morning I got up and I was just thinking, for some reason I was thinking about fourth intervals and just kind of sitting and running in my head, different ways of manipulating fourth intervals. You know, I mean, if you were to, if you were to stack you know, one on top of another, you would get, and if you were to move that, those two fourths around a minor third part, you would get, things like that, and it just, it was kind of a nice shape, and I, I thought, I was starting to think about, well, how might I integrate that into, you know, a playing situation, so, you know, there's really a lot, there's a lot of things to, to ponder and, and to think about the question, particularly as, a, as an improviser. That's, that's, that's what I love to do. I love to, to come to a musical setting, you know, where there are some rules and room for elaboration and just try to, to, you know, to be to, two things. One, to, to really make something of the music and elaborate and improvise and, you know, expound on a given subject, but also to be on the team, to be part of an ensemble, to play and listen at the same time. And maybe the listening part is even more important than the 
playing card. Um, and the guys I like to play with are really good listeners. You know? and, um, they, they more often than not want to hear what you have to say rather than having you hear what they have to say. It sort of it, it, it goes the other way around. Um, you know, if I'm going to play, say, just hypothetically, I'm going to play a blues. I, I step up with a band and I'm going to sit in and play with them and I'm going to play a blues progression. Well, I'm not going to get up there and like play a whole lot of stuff right away because it would be the equivalent of having a conversation with somebody where they never stop talking which is fairly uninteresting for you and you know, doesn't really give you a chance to express yourself. So I might play a blues and I go, one, two, so one, two, three. <laughs> So, I could go on for days, but to keep it fairly brief, um, how, many, how many people here play some jazz saxophone? Raise your hand. Okay, a little bit. So, okay. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, I mean, having, having played both classical and jazz saxophone, probably more, definitely jazz, but, but I've worked with the New York Philharmonic and a lot of the groups in, in New York City uh, when saxophone was, was called for. I played a beautiful piece by the opera conductor Giuseppe Sinopoli, wrote a piece for the New York Philharmonic with a tenor saxophone and muted trumpet solo over muted strings. That was just amazing. I got to do that like three concerts in a row back in the 80s. But um, I think there's a lot of connective tissue in there, so it might be worth your while to check out, particularly some of the newer players that, uh, that really are drawing from both influences. Brantford Marcellus, uh, going in Mark Turner, who's a very interesting player, Chris Potter, some of these younger guys really, uh, although they're, they function in the jazz realm, have really drawn from all, all different kinds of influences. Um, and you'll, you'll hear that way of playing in sax assault as well, a lot of those guys you know, do all different kinds of things. Um, so, any thoughts, questions? I'm at your disposal. Is there anything you want to know about or could tell me about? We'd love to hear. Good jokes? <laughs> Bad jokes? <laughs> Yes, sir. I'm going to answer this. You know, this you're talking about jazz and classical, because such a thing from traveling to different countries, what do you feel about 
this idea about trying to play a saxophone in the modern age, but yet most of the, the university will say you either do classical or jazz. Do you think that's a healthy thing? Um, no. I, I think, I mean, personally, and I'm probably, probably going to elicit a lot of scowls, but I, I think it's, it's, it's a shame if you go to a university and don't learn all different ways of playing because that would be an opportunity to have credentials and training that would allow you to work, you know, in a lot of different settings. I mean, when I came up in New York, I was working every day. Why? Because I could play with a symphony orchestra one day, a big band the next, playing a punk record the next, you know, play an R&B soul on an Aretha Franklin record the next. And, and uh, I'm very grateful that I had training that at least allowed me to, you know, I didn't have some teacher breathing down my neck saying, you must only play classical. I mean, that, that, that's old fashioned in my way of thinking. I mean, that doesn't work anymore. I mean, yeah, I mean maybe it does for some, for a slight few. But uh, how many orchestra gigs are there for saxophone players? Not so many. Uh, just my opinion. You know, maybe that's why I've never been to a World Saxophone Conference. <laughs> Anybody else? But good point. Yeah, good point. I mean, I never. I, I studied for a semester with a fellow named Don Sinta, who I uh, went to Hard College of Music, and he later on went to the University of Michigan. He was one of the Larry Teal guys and all that. And, uh, he really knew very little about jazz. You know, in fact, he used to I'd go to a lesson and he'd say, you mean you can play jazz? I mean, he sort of had his doubts that you know, somebody like myself could even play jazz. And I said, well, I don't know, I think so. I'm trying, you know, I'm trying to learn how to play. But Jackie McLean was also at heart, so um, I would hang out with Jackie and get my jazz fix over there and take some lessons with Don Sinton and you know, learn about the Ebert, some of the Marshall Mule etudes and all that. But I mean, I, my, my goal was always to sort of find some middle ground where you know, they all came together and I was able to come up with the music that I could feel comfortable playing and call my own, which is precisely what I've done. Yeah? Uh, can you tell us about uh, solo construction? You, you, you kind of think about solo construction? Solo construction, you know what I'm improvising, you mean? Yeah, I'm not thinking about much of anything uh, <laughs> when I play, but I've given a, given a great deal of thought to possibilities, as in, you know, practicing little intervallic things, uh, learning a lot of tunes, uh, learning other people's solos, um, you know, perhaps taking something you hear in someone's solo and isolating it, and then building something around that. You know, think really a, a, approaching it very compositionally. And I think if you do that enough, and you play for a long enough time, you get very familiar with the notes and these little shapes and melodies to the point where you can really summon them forth with no thought. And the idea is to kind of get out of the way of the music, let, let the music come out. You know, uh, I mean, I've played, I mean, here's, here's kind of a silly analogy, but when you brush your teeth, are you thinking, okay, left, right, left, right? <laughs> so, you know, it's something you've done enough, and again, not to really compare brushing your teeth with playing music, but, you know, one is, okay. So, but, but it's, it's that sort of, you, you've done it enough, so you're thinking, you're not thinking about it, it just kind of happens, you know? So that's, that's the point you want to get to. And, and, you know, I mean, so, you also might say, okay, I'm going to play a solo saxophone piece for four minutes, Sit down and on a piece of paper, write, write out just hypothetically what might happen event-wise. You, know, you might start with some short phrases. You might evolve to some longer phrases with some kind of arpeggiated shape. You might wind up with like a little motif that you repeat and move around. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty wide open. But, but by doing that, it kind of forces you to start thinking compositionally and then, you know, trying to create an arc in, in a little piece you play. Good question. Yeah, I think that some classical players are scared of jazz. Um, Would you have any advice for them? Scared of jazz. Um, <laughs> I get yeah, scared of jazz sometimes, you know. Uh, but, well, it, I mean, you know, music is a language, and uh, you know, playing 
classical saxophone is a language, and, and you, you become proficient at it through exposure and listening and an analyzing and utilizing. And I think it's the same, the same holds true with any kind of music, jazz in particular. You know, it's a question of just listening with an open mind and trying to, to hear inside the music a little bit, see what's going on, and see what, what exactly the saxophonist does, what the rest of the musicians do, and, and try to see how it works. I would say just try to approach the music with an open mind. In terms of improvising, anyway, any, you know, if you're if you're uncomfortable, my son is, plays the clarinet. He's uncomfortable in improvising for whatever reason. You know, probably because I'm his father. <laughs> but you know, I, I mean, it's a question of you just you sort of have to force yourself through the, the, the fear and just try things. You know, I mean, you might like just just take. You know, sometimes I'll take I'll tell a student take three notes like one, four, five. Like, and just play play those three notes or that shape in a variety of ways. You know, I mean, it could be it's something like. Perfect, you know, really in a certain way. But 
Um, and then, you know, I just started playing, and I realized sound is such a, you know, it's like first and foremost the thing that kind of people really pick up on. So I just wanted to have a, 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 a you know, pleasing, round, beautiful sound, uh, for, for at least as a starting point. And, uh, I don't know, you know, I think through the process of putting the notes together, you, and hearing yourself on recordings, you know, you, you go for a sound that's pleasing to your ear. And have you been going through bass pieces, saxophones? No, I don't go through that. No. Life's too short. <laughs> you know, I, 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 um, I, uh, I find a mouthpiece that works and I stay with it for a long time, you know, until there's really a compelling reason to change. And actually, I'll, when I used to do freelance work in New York, you know, I'd I come into the Philharmonic, and at that time I was playing on a metal Dukoff mouthpiece, and I'd walk into the Philharmonic, and I remember the guys in the woodwind section, they would like start climbing under their chairs because you know, <laughs> there's this maniac, you know, with a metal mouthpiece coming from the New York Philharmonic. But I mean, I could actually play that in a controlled way. I could play soft on it, you know, and I used to read that was appropriate. It was one of the large chamber Dukoff, so it wasn't overly bright. Again, I think it's the sound you hear in your head. Sorry, just to just follow a bit. Yeah. Do you play that saxophone just for any reason? Um, do I play this saxophone? No, no, this one, just brown. This, do I play Selma for a reason? Yeah, because they're very good saxophones. Okay, buddy. And I'm not, I'm not saying that because Patrick is sitting there. I mean, I, I, I truly, I played Selma my whole life. Except I had a con when I was a little kid. I mean, when I was a little kid, you know, when we were kids, you didn't get a, a shiny Selma. You got like a beat up old con. <laughs> Until he really, and I remember, you know, I mean, my parents were, went through the depression, so you know, they were like, how much for a saxophone? You know, it was like that, so. Um, but, yeah, I think cellars are, are really the, the standard of saxophones, for my way of thinking. Which saxophone are you playing? This is, a, this is an early Mark VI from 1954, I believe. That was gold plated about 12 years ago. <laughs> It works. It works. But I mean, you know, my students sometimes, when, when they get, when I see them getting a little overly concerned with instruments, I remind them that Charlie Parker played on a different horn every week and some pretty lousy ones, and he always sounded great. So you know, I mean, yeah, get a good horn, but don't, you know, then move on and start working on the music. Anybody else? How many composers we have here? Composers, arrangers? A couple. Yeah, you might want to start thinking about that. I really strongly recommend it. You know, it's, it's, it's a wonderful activity. It's, it's, it's the best way I know to control your destiny as a, as a player. You know, it, uh, when I join a band, I, I think, okay, I'm going to play with these guys. How would I best like to be included in this environment? And I can then write a piece that includes my playing in a controlled, specific way. And it's, it's great. It's great to have that ability. Not to mention the fact that as a composer, you then have a reason to gather musicians together and play. And it's really all about playing. You know? I mean, I, I, I attribute whatever I can do today to the fact that I play a lot. Do you spend much time at the keyboard? I did. I do. Yeah, I do. I actually, I did more at one time than another. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a good point. Thank you. Um, playing piano is really the, the window into the world of arranging composition. I, I, was, I, I couldn't do half of what I do uh, without some piano skills. And uh, yes, but very, very important. As a teacher as well, I, mean, I play a lot of piano with students. It's in every idiom to be able to, you know, to, to read and play a little bit is, is, is so very important. As a composer and arranger as well, I mean, I got the Sibelius software a few years ago, and it really I cut, wound up cutting back dramatically on my piano playing because I had my laptop. And uh, it's kind of nice in a way to get away from the piano as a composer, you know, and just kind of use 
the imagination and kind of put notes together and then see what you go. But, but piano is good for just trying things, you know, manipulating, moving things around, looking at different voices, different movements. So, yeah. yeah. Who would you Who were my influences? Oh, so, how, how long do you have for me to, that would take hours. But um, as a player, let me see if I can condense. Um, you know, I mentioned Lester Young and George Coleman, John Coltrane, Sonny Rollins, Dexter Gordon, Sonny Stitt, uh, Paul Gonzalez, uh, Paul Desmond, King Curtis, Junior Walker, uh, Marcel Newell, <laughs> Sigur Rasher, just, just to smooth things out. Um, um, you know, uh, uh, Maceo Parker, uh, as a composer, everybody, everything, anything, you know, your music. Um, I really, uh, in my antenna are up, I'm mean, just looking everywhere to, for, for little interesting ideas musically. And, um, yeah, I, I, like, I like diversity, you know, I don't, I don't like eating the same thing every night, nor do I like listening to the same kind of music. All the time, I really spread pretty wide. But but then I find that when I combine the various styles of all these different players and composers, I'm able to come up with a sound and musical way of thinking that's now that sort of you know has certain parameters, certain rules, certain qualities to it. You know, I think the Yellow Jackets music is, is a pretty good example. Very identifiable, certain sound, certain con conception where. In, in the case of the Yellow Jackets, the, the band has done things with rhythm to kind of obscure the four-bar phrase by doing things with rhythm that, that are calculated but sort of curious to listen to. You sort of, you know, you want to dance, but it's in 5-4, so you're not really sure how to do it in the next thing. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty wide, pretty broad in terms of influences. Sorry? Can I ask you one more question? Yeah, sure. When you compose something, um, you have entire picture already? Oh, yeah. you mean like Mozart? Yeah. No, I'm not that smart. <laughs> but uh, uh, when I write something, I, I generally imagine certain shapes. You know, I use this word shape. It's kind of a non-specific word where you might hear a little theme or a certain groove or a certain context, a certain setting, and then, you know, I try to approximate what I'm imagining in some kind of way. I might just throw some things in Sibelius on a score. Um, I start thinking broad first, you know, as in form. Okay, so this, this thing is going to happen here, so what would happen next, and how would I get to that next thing? So just kind of putting sections down and trying to tie them in together. You know, again, non-specific. And then, as I keep going through, go through, go through, I'll get a little more specific in terms of particulars, counterpoint, you know, harmonic movement, you know. But it's always in a state of change, and it takes me a long time to write these terms. If you are combining something, the way you compose, you combine the pulse, Combine the pulse, you pulse. Do, are, you, are you asking, do I like take? How do I compose? Um, yeah, I think that's what I'm talking about. Um, you know, I start general and then I get more specific and I just keep, keep working on it. And uh, hopefully it turns out to be something worth listening to or playing, but not always, you know. Especially, you got to be careful with Sibelius, you know, with computers sometimes. You can program some stuff into a computer and you hit play and it's like, okay, cool. And then you write, you know, you pass out the parts and get humans to play it and it just sounds terrible, it feels terrible, it doesn't work at all. So, yeah, it's, it's funny, you know, you really, I think you have to have had the experience of playing with live musicians in live settings to really utilize synthesizers, sequencers, and, you know, music notation software, you know, to, to come up with something that's musical. Anyway, one last question and then uh, gotta go. Yeah, well, could you yeah. compose something for us now? 
Sure. Yeah. Okay. I'll make. I'll compose one for you.